And while he was praying, the aspect of his face changed its appearance and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men were talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in heavenly glory. You will fulfill God's purpose. You will die in Jerusalem. As they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, how good it is that we are here. We will make three tents. One for you. As Peter spoke, one a cloud Moses, came and overshadowed them. And one for Elijah. And the disciples were afraid. And a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. Thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Lord, for giving us the ability to hear your voice today. Lord, even as we delve into this next installment of your word on, Lord, worship being a response to your glory. We ask you, Lord, to speak to us. We declare each of our hearts a good soil. And then, Lord, because our hearts are good soil, as you sow this word into our hearts, God, your word will be a fruit. And we will be able to encounter you and hear from you. God, our lives will be a reflection of that good work that you're doing in us. We give you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, Amen and Amen. So, we are on our series, The Meeting Place. We've been doing this for about a year and something. And we are building a, a theme around developing a culture of prayer, worship, and intimacy with God. For the last three weeks, we have been stuck on this one thing. Worship is a response to God's glory. Worship is a response to, to God's glory. And this week, we're going to go into our third installment on worship being a response to God's glory. So let's begin. This is our theme scripture for the series, The Meeting Place, Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 to 4. Let's read it together. It's on the screen after 3, 2, 3. Then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle on the first day of the new year. Place the Ark of the Covenant inside and install the inner curtain to enclose the Ark within the most holy place. Then bring in the table and arrange the utensils on it and bring in the lampstand and set up the lamps. And then let's read verses 34 to 35 of Exodus 40. Then he hung the curtains forming the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar, and he set up the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard. So at last Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the Lord gave us a word saying, prepare the place for my presence and then my presence is going to show up so the theme here for the scripture is first the place then the presence so as you see here god gave moses very specific instructions about the tent of meeting about the tabernacle and he was like i want you to set things up a certain way he was very detail oriented he wanted the curtain a certain place he wanted a certain table he wanted the utensils arranged on the table he wanted a lamp stand with lamps on it he was very specific about how we want things set up. And then after everything was set up, the Lord was like, all right, I'm good with this. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And that's the word the Lord gave us. When God instructed Moses to build a tent of meeting, it was the first step in the process of hosting his presence. And God's word to us is to set this place apart as his meeting place. And our assignment is to put the spiritual structure together. Once that is complete, he will show up in his glory. So one day we were praying, walking around here and just filling the place with worship. And the Lord spoke to us and he said, this is the meeting place. That's his name. 
if you read the Bible, many times people will be in God's presence and then God would speak to them and say, you know what? Forget it. Your name is not Abraham anymore. Your name is Abraham. Your name is not Sarah. Your name is Sarah. He said the same thing to us. He's like, your name is the meeting place. And he said, people come here to meet with you. That is your assignment. And I want you to put these five pillars together to build the meeting place. Pillar number one, prayer. Pillar number two, worship. Pillar number three, the word. Pillar number four, fellowship. Pillar number five, intimacy. He said, give me these five and I am going to have the structure I need for me to respond with my glory. We spent a year on prayer, going inside and out, studying it every week. We squeezed prayer dry. We had nights of prayer, weeks of prayer, and then the Lord said, 2019, worship. So this year we've been studying what the Lord wants us to do concerning worship because after five years, we're gonna go through each one of these and the Lord has given us an assignment. Take your time, build it solid, build it strong, and then watch my presence show up in this place. So when we talk about the word worship, we are speaking from the Hebrew, shokor. Shokor. To depress, prostrate, especially reflexive in homage to royalty or God. To bow yourself down, to crouch, to fall down flat. Humbly beseech, do make obedience, do reverence, make the stoop, worship. All through the Old Testament, you see the word worship. This is the word that they use most of the times, shokor. This is what they're talking about when you see worship. And the standard that we use to speak about worship is worship in heaven. If you want to know what worship looks like at its best, the creme de la creme of worship, you take a picture of worship in heaven and use that as your example. That's what we put on the board and we say, all right, that's what we're trying to get to. That's our goal. Let's read Revelations 4, 1 to 11 to see what the gold standard of worship looks like. After 3, 2, 3. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like Jasper and Carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. So this is what all the attention was focused on. That's what the throne looked like, and that's what the one on the throne looked like. It was a showcase of God's glory. This is what John saw when God said, come up hither and open your eyes and let me show you something. Let's keep reading. 24 thrones surrounded him, and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and a rumble of thunder. So here is God looking amazing. Brilliant as gemstones, jasper, carnelian, glow of an emerald, circle the throne. And at the same time, there's lightning flashing and there's the rumble of thunder. So it was a serious show going on. It was, it was impressive. And John is like, wow, that's some serious action going on there at the throne. And everybody's around him. The 24 elders on their own thrones, clothed in white with gold crowns on their heads. Let's keep going. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face. And the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes. Inside and out, day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and they exist because you created what you please. So this is worship at its finest. It's worship in front of the throne of God. So you know, you don't get better than that. This is it. God is on his throne. It's a light show. It's gems everywhere. It's amazing. All the elders are there. The creatures are there. They're worshiping the way worship's supposed to look like. 
So we go in there and we read the scripture and we're saying, how can we learn from this? What can we glean from this that we can now apply to how we approach worship? Worship before the throne of God in heaven is the gold standard of worship. It is what true worship looks like. Remember Jesus talked about true worshipers. He said, you know what? You guys don't know who you worship. We know who we worship. And then he said, forget about this mountain. Forget about where you worship. Let's talk about who you worship and how you worship. And he said, and who's doing the worshiping? And he was like, look, this is what God's looking for. True worshipers. Those who are worshiping in spirit and in truth. True worship looks like what we just saw. It's 100% focused on God. And it's completely the spirit realm. The scripture is very clear. He said to John, come up hither. And I'll show you things to come. And then he said, the scripture says, he was immediately in the spirit. Which means in the natural, he wasn't seeing all that. He had to come in the spirit to visualize what's going on. Even Apostle John had to be in the spirit just to see it. And from it, we learned some valuable characteristics of true worship. Now let's break this down. What did we get out of that scripture? Revelations 4 verses 1 to 11. We got 10 characteristics of true worship. 10 characteristics of true worship. The first one is what? God extends the invitation. What's the second one? It's 100% spiritual. Number three, it's a response to God's glory. And that's what we've been stuck on for the last three weeks. Worship being a response to God's glory. Because there's so much in there that God wants to show us, so much to unwrap. He's like, give me one more week. Give me one more week. So we're like, all right, this is our third week. Worship is a response to God's glory. After that, we're going to focus on, it's focused on God. True worshipers are holy. Number six, it's led by the Holy Ghost. Nobody's too big for it. It's about God's holiness. It's submission. It restores order. That's what God sees and shows us when it comes to true worship. He's like, y'all, look at what we are doing in heaven. That's the standard. And we glean these 10 things out of Revelation. Everybody sees that? So let's keep going. Worship is a response to God's glory. We pull it out of Revelation 4.3. Let's read that piece. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian, and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. That is what the four and twenty elders were seeing. That's what the living creatures were seeing. It was a show. And they were worshipping in response to what was in front of them. So as Apostle John observed worship in heaven, the first thing he noticed was God on his throne. Then he noticed God's glory. There's a reason why the worship was so glorious. It was a direct response to God in his glorious splendor. If you see God like that, you can't help but worship him. That's why your worship is a response to who you see God as, to what you see of God. So you see God's glory, you're going to worship. Everybody gets that? The word glory. Kavod. Kavod. Hebrew. When you hear the word glory, it talks about God's weight, honor, splendor. When somebody says the glory of God, you go to the Old Testament and you study it. The weight, the honor, the splendor of God. God's glory is his discernible, recognizable, sometimes tangible presence. Then somebody says, hey, I encountered the glory of God. But that person is saying, I encountered God's presence in such a way that I could actually tell yeah. the presence of the Lord was there. It was discernible. I could discern it. I can tell something changed in the atmosphere. This is different. Discernible. Recognizable. I could recognize that the Lord was there. Not just I think, I believe by faith. No, I can tell you, yes. Without a question, I know I encountered the Holy Ghost. And sometimes changeable. Sometimes you can feel something. You can actually feel something sometimes. You'll be like, what was that? The Holy Ghost can show up in such a way where you can tell something just happened. I can feel some, I can feel him in this place. I can leave, I don't feel him. I can come in, I can feel him. I go somewhere else and I don't feel him. And I come over here and I can feel him. That's what we're talking about, where we go beyond just by faith, I believe the Lord's there because he's omnipresent, he's everywhere. And go to, yes, he's omnipresent, but he's manifested in this place in a special way. Right. When I come in here, something's different. When, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when we sing that song, something changes. Like there's something about this manifestation of the presence of the Lord that's different from everything else I'm encountering with him. And we're talking about God's weight, 
his honor, his splendor, where you can feel something rest on you. Feel something rest in the room. You can feel it's thick with the presence of the Lord. That's what we're talking about, the glory of God. Everybody gets that? Discernible, recognizable, sometimes tangible presence of God. Weight, honor, splendor. Kavod. So let's talk about reflecting God's glory. Exodus 34, 29 to 35, a story of Moses tangibly impacted by the glory of God in such a way that it changed the way he looked that it scared people. Like, he encountered the presence of the Lord in such a way that he changed. He didn't walk out of God's presence the same way he walked in. And that's what we're talking about. That kind of presence of the Lord. The glory of God where something happens to you. Where you don't just walk in and walk away. Oh, that was cool. No, it wasn't just cool. Something happened to me. Exodus 34 verse 29 to 35. Let's read it together. Exodus 34, 29 to 35. New King James Version after 3, 2, 3. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So he's talking to God. And you know, God is blinding light. There's other scriptures that said that. He's blinding light. And he didn't know his face is shining. Obviously, you can't tell. God's there. And he's shining. And just the presence of the Lord impacted him physically. And he had no idea. He just kind of walked out normal, normal, like, all right, well, let me just go back and talk to these people. Let's keep reading. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. And they were afraid to come near him. That's reasonable. You see a man shining like light. You will be like, ah, I don't know about that. It doesn't, it's different to a man with a light shining it. Different than that, but the man's shining. You're like, I don't know about you. You know what I'm saying? And especially Moses. He walked up there. He didn't walk up looking like that. He came back. And they were like, even Aaron was afraid. Aaron too. Aaron the priest. I was like, I don't know. I don't know about this guy. They were afraid to come near him. That's what the presence of the Lord does. He comes down with the glory of God shining so strong that they were like, ah, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> Let's keep going. Then Moses called to them. And Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them. Moses was like, what's wrong with you all? Come, come, come. It's Moses. Got all the shining stuff had them like, whoa. He's like, it's Moses. Everybody come. Everybody come. Keep reading. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again. Until he went in to speak with him. So that was Moses' um, that, I mean, that was a strategy. That was his approach. Just hold a veil with him. He come out. Put the veil on. Hey guys, how are you guys doing? Good. This is what the Lord said. Go back to the Lord. Alright God, I could get this off of my face. And talk to God face to face like normal. And then he's like, well, let me go talk to these people. Put the veil on. And he had to do that all the time. And the scripture showed it. It was back and forth, back and forth. Alright, let me go talk to these people. Put the veil on. All right, God, let me go back and talk to you. Take the veil off. And, well, so, and it was like, it's, it's, it's multi-layered. On the one dimension, physically, he and God had a face-to-face -face relationship where he did not need to put a veil on his face because the presence of the Lord impacted him. The Lord liked speaking to him. They were friends. With the people, on the other hand, couldn't handle the presence of the Lord like that. So even a remnant of the presence of the Lord on Moses was too much for them. Far less for them even going to God's face themselves. Just the reflection of God's glory, they couldn't handle it. Yeah. And that's from a physical perspective. Now figuratively, Moses was able to speak to God plain. He was able to interact with God without any covering, without any pretense, without any mask. Because God can handle him. He knew Moses, Moses knew God. They were cool like that. The people, not so much. So that's why he needed a veil. It's like Jesus speaking in parables. But he's like, you know what? When I'm with my disciples, I can tell you exactly what God's saying. But everybody else, eh, they can't handle it. I'm just going to give them a big picture. You know, let me get a story that kind of gets to the point And it's going to blow your mind still. But it's not really the real deal. That was 
a figurative description of what it was like, you know? Veil, you and I, we're cool, but we're not that cool. God, you and I, we're really, really close. Veil, we're cool, but we're not that cool. We're really, really close. And that was how Moses had to operate nonstop. So the time Moses spent in God's presence physically impacted him. And he didn't even know it. The glory of God caused his face to shine. And it scared the children of Israel so much that he had to put a veil on his face. How has the presence of God changed you? And do the people around you see the difference? Is it possible that the presence of the Lord could impact you to the point where other people could notice? Because if you read something about Peter and John, Peter and John, who were unlearned men, the scripture called them unlearned, you know, in our, in our vernacular, it'll be, it's all to be like, whoa, you're very unlearned. But the scripture is very honest. You know what I'm saying? The scripture is like, look, let's just be honest. Two fishermen, they're unlearned, and they get out there, and they are speaking to people. The Bible is real clear. That's very, very straightforward. They, they don't care about offending people. They're unlearned. Let's just be honest. Not even try. They didn't try to use nice words. So these two guys are speaking. The scripture says that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and one translation says, when they heard the unfettered eloquence of Peter and John, the people said, they must have been with Jesus. In other words, they knew that the only way these two fishermen could stand up in front of us with such authority and speak with such boldness and speak with such eloquence and confidence and speak words that can impact our lives, they must have been with Jesus. How has Jesus impacted you to the point where people can recognize it? Yes. Where they can look at you and be like, yeah. She must have been with Jesus. He must have been with Jesus. You know what? He had to be a Christian. She had to be a Christian. Man, I can tell you, you be going to church, right? I can tell you, 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 you have that kind of vibe, like you, you just worship God. Like, how has the Prince of the Lord impacted you so that other people can notice it? Because Moses, they knew he had been with the Lord because he was physically shining. But what has happened to you? How have you been impacted? But let's talk about glory in the New Testament now. Glory in the Greek, doxa. In the Greek, doxa. We're going to bring it up to the New Testament now. What does that mean? One, magnificence, excellence, preeminence, dignity, grace. So when you read in the New Testament about the glory of God, you're talking about God's magnificence, his excellence, his preeminence, his dignity, his grace. What else are you talking about when you talk about glory of God in the New Testament? The kingly majesty which belongs to him as supreme ruler. Majesty in the sense of the absolute perfection of the deity. So somebody says, hey, the glory of God. I encountered the glory of God. I encountered God's perfection. His majesty. His, his supreme, his supremeness. And then, of course, the glory of God. The absolutely perfect inward. And I wanted to, I like this one. Because it's both inward or personal excellency of Christ. The majesty. This one talks about the glory of God inward, the inside. Where I'm not just talking about your face shining. I'm not just talking about something physical and amazing. I'm talking about something inside of you having changed like Christ. Where the inside of me now is an inward reflection of Christ. Where when I reflect God, I'm not just reflecting him physically. I'm, I don't just look like God. I act like God. I think like God. When people see me, they see the character of God coming out from the inside of me. I am communicating God from the inside out. The perfect inward or personal excellency of Christ. So when I say, hey, we want the glory of God in this place. Yes, we want to feel him. Yes, we want to encounter his presence so we can get healing and deliverance and freedom. Because the scripture is very clear. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. And it's right on there, pledges forevermore. We want the glory of God because miracles take place in the glory of God. Yes, sir. We want all of that. But we also want the inward change that comes from encountering God's presence. Mm -hmm. Where something about me changes when I'm around God. So Jesus went to this tax collector to have dinner. You know, everybody's looking at him like, how are you going to have dinner with a tax collector? My name is He's over there eating at the man's table, right? He's a tax collector, right? Now, it's amazing. And it's, what do you tell? I heard one pastor point this out. It blew my mind. Jesus was sitting down eating, just minding his business. 
And the tax collector just all of a sudden gets up and says, I repent. I'm going to give back twice as much to all the people I stole from. And I'm never going to do this stuff again. And Jesus probably was looking up with some chicken in his mouth like, okay. He was just eating. I mean, he didn't tell the man nothing. He was like, you must repent of your sins. He was just eating a meal. But because he was in the presence of the Lord, yeah. the man just felt guilty. Yeah. He felt dirty. I'm so wrong. He's like, I repent. Jesus is like, okay. Repent. The man just threw his hands in the air. I'm done. I'm going to give twice back to the people I stole from. Something about being in the presence of the Lord does something to you when you're genuinely in the presence of the Lord. I saw this talk about my, one of my friends who's like a real Christian. You know you have Christian friends? You have a real Christian friend? But <laughs> like he's a real Christian. And he was that guy where whenever you're around him, if you sin, you can feel the sin. You're like, oh, I'm so dirty. I'm around this guy. I feel like, oh, I just want to repent. You just want to fall on your face and say, Lord, forgive me for I have sinned. Because you're just around somebody who exudes the presence of the Lord. You can't look in their eye when you're wrong. You're like, you look in their eye, you know, oh God, forgive me. I, can, he, I think he could see, he could see, he could see my sins. And the Lord is like, when you're in the glory of God, you can see who God is. And something about his inward and personal excellency is reflected. You can see God for his true character. Magnificence, excellence, preeminence, dignity, grace. The kingly majesty that belongs to him as supreme ruler. Majesty in the sense of the absolute perfection of the deity. As they always say, if I have a dingy white shirt and somebody brings a white, crisp new shirt, you can tell how dingy your white shirt is. Yeah. Same thing. When I'm around this level of perfection, I can tell all of my flaws. But let's talk about God's glory in a more practical way. We're going to start with God's glory and his angels. Luke 2, verse 8 to 14. God's glory and his angels. Luke 2, verses 8 to 14. Let's read it together on the screen after 3. 2, 3. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. So here are some people, some what, shepherds, living in the fields, and an angel shows up. And the angel shows up with whose glory? The glory of the Lord. So the angels didn't just come by themselves, just arbitrary, arbitrary. They live in the presence of the Lord, and they showed up, and you can see the glory of the Lord all around the angels. Now remember, Moses would just go in and spend a little bit of time with the Lord. 40 days, 40 nights, come out. And he was already shining with the glory of God. Far less for angels that live there. They be there. So you know they're reflecting the glory of the Lord very, very much. Let's keep going. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in a swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So you know the story, shepherds in the field, the angels come to announce Jesus. But they don't just come with their hands swinging. They come with the glory of God. And it impacts the people too much that they were afraid. Like if you go through the scriptures, every time an angel showed up in God's glory, folks were scared. That's how impacting the glory of God is. Where you can't just ignore it. Now sometimes they come in and they just come looking normal. But let them come in the glory of God and all of a sudden. Because we can't handle that. What we see, this is, this is nothing. Compared to the presence of the Lord. When the Holy Ghost shows up, and when the angels show up in the power and in the glory of the Holy Ghost, in the power of the Lord, you can't handle that. Now let's read Hebrews 1, 6 to 7, and verse 14. Talking about God's glory in his angels. Let's read it together after 3, 2, 3. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? 
So here is the scripture saying that God makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. He sends these angels out with his anointing, with his power, with the fire from his throne. Angels don't just show up empty-handed. They show up with authority. They show up with power. They show up with the fire of God. Ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Those of us who are Christians know that. We are the ones inheriting salvation, which means angels are sent forth to minister for us. Flames of fire. He puts his glory on his angels. The angels of God reflect his glory. They live in God's presence, so his glory is all over them. When angelic visitations take place, they can be impacting and life-changing. Those of us who have encountered angels, we know what it's like. Like, you know, you don't forget it. That's why, like, mommy would be like, man, you had to write that down. I said, write it down? <laughs> I was like, I cannot forget encountering angels. That I can tell you that story over and over and over for years and years and years like it just happened. Why? That stuff impacts you. You don't just encounter God's presence and his glory like that, especially God's glory and his angels, that you're just going to walk in and be like, oh, that's cool. You don't forget that? You know what I'm saying? That's why we keep saying, Lord, we want to encounter your glory because we know if we encounter the glory of God, yes. it's going to change us. Yes. It's going to impact us so much that we're not going to be able to walk away normal and be like, yeah, I know about this Jesus thing. Well, yeah, because yeah, you never really encounter him for real. Like, you get a, a for real encounter with the Lord, you don't, you don't get that day where you reach like, I don't know about this God thing. No, you, you can't do that. Because your, your brain has already been shifted. Your mindset has already changed. I have seen the Lord and I've lived. I am good. I'm with you. But let's talk about a glimpse of God's glory in Jesus. And that's what we saw in the video. A glimpse of God's glory in Jesus. Just a glimpse. Luke 9, 28 to 36. Luke 9, 28 to 36. And that's the thing I loved about Jesus. If you read about those, those years of his ministry, you know, those, the, the last three years, he would always, every now and then, do a little something to remind you of who he was. You know, like, people say, oh, Jesus, we just, just blended in. He was a, just like a, like a regular guy. Yes and no. Yes, from the perspective of he didn't make a scene. And no, from the perspective of every now and then, he will make a scene and remind you of who he is. And this is one of those episodes where he's just like, by the way, in case you all forgot, I'm the living God, just looking normal. Yeah. So don't sleep on who this is. And this is what he did with Peter, James, and John, just to remind them. Luke 9, 28 to 36. That's why I like how Jesus operated. He was cool. But every now and then, he had to let you know. By the way, I'm God. Luke 9, 28 to 36. Let's read it together. Two, three. Yeah. Now it came to pass about eight days after these saves yes. that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah. Like, was that all that necessary? He's like, I just had to let them know. Like, look, just, just so you know. You know, because he got done it by himself too. He's like, no, I want Peter and John and James to recognize who I am. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just going to pray. And then while I'm praying, I'm going to start glowing. And then while I'm glowing, Moses and Elijah are going to materialize out of the spirit realm. <laughs> just so they can see, yeah, I'm for real. Yeah. That's why it's always funny when people talk about, yeah, you know, Jesus was just one of those prophets. I was like, okay. Which other prophet did this kind of stuff? I mean, he's just he's praying normal, normal. And then all of a sudden he starts glowing. Like, what's all that about? And then Mo Moses and Elijah just show up. And they just start talking and having a full conversation. And this Peter, James, and John is looking at them like, okay. Yeah, they're just looking at it. Let's keep reading. Wait, stop. Let's go from, and behold. Let's go. And behold, two men talk with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Stop right there. So they ain't on the time, oh yeah. Jesus, you know, you, 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 you got to go to the cross, which he knew, but it was good to have a reminder. Both Moses and Elijah came to remind them again, hey, we're going to the cross, right? 
Remember the plan. Stick with the plan. We go into the cross. Because nobody else really understood. I mean, even his right hand man, Peter, was like, you're not going to no cross. If they come, I'll be right there to save you. It's like nobody's taking you. He's like, all right. God was like, Pete, Moses and Elijah, we need to go down and chat with him a little bit. And he reminded them. And they were also in God's glory. So here is Jesus, who in an instant was able to just flip a switch and be like, the glory of God started to shine on him. And then Moses and Elijah show up in God's glory. Just to remind him, by the way, you're going to the cross. Let's keep reading. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. So Moses and Elijah stand up there with Jesus. And they're all in God's glory. And Peter and the guys finally wake up. Like they were still heavy with sleep. In other words, they were drowsy. But as soon as they, they catch themselves, they saw God's glory. That was what they were seeing on Jesus. They saw his glory. And they saw the two men standing with him. Moses and Elijah. Let's keep reading. Then it happened, as they were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. Number one, how could he recognize Moses and Elijah? He had a picture? He had a picture? How could he tell who the two men were? He just knew exactly who they were. Oh, that's Moses and Elijah. How do you know? The Holy Ghost. Like, listen, people used to sleep on Peter. Peter was no joke either. First, he knew that Jesus was the Christ, son of the living God. Then, he could recognize Moses and Elijah. Hey, that's Moses, that's Elijah. But here was the point of the whole thing. How did Peter respond to the glory of God? He saw Moses and Elijah. He saw Jesus in his glory. And what was his first thought? Hey, let's make some tabernacles. It's like, what do you do when you see the glory of God like that? You're ready to worship one time. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I got, I got to memorialize this. You don't just see God in his glory and just be like, oh, that's cool. Let me go back to sleep. Yeah. No, you respond with worship. And that's why your worship has to be based on your encounter with the Lord. Until I see God a certain way, until I encounter God a certain way, my worship can be elevated. Yes. It's always going to stay at a certain level because that's the level I know God at. That's the level of my encounter with God. If all I do is go to church and read the Bible and go home and act normal, that's how much I'm going to worship God. That's the level my worship is going to be. If I'm a Easter and Christmas, that's the level my worship is going to be. Yeah. And the point is, this man saw Jesus in his glory and was ready to build a tabernacle. Yeah. And he was like, for Moses and Elijah too. That's just tabernacle time. <laughs> that, was, that was his response. We have to do something about this. Yes. That's how amazing it was. And that's why when God says, let me show you my glory, because I know if you see my glory, you will not help but respond with worship. Yes. So. He said, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Let's keep reading. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. So, I mean, if you thought that was everything, God was like, the grand finale, a cloud comes and descends on them. And then inside the cloud, they start hearing God's voice talking to them. I mean, Peter, James, and John, look at... Look at the encounter they had with the Lord. I mean, you can't forget this stuff. Which is why, of course, they turned into powerful, I mean, powerful testimonies of God's goodness and God's grace. Powerful preachers of the gospel. You can't have these kinds of experiences and then say, well, I'm done with this. I know about the Jesus thing. And people be like, well, I know, you're you, you full of a myth. You know what you're talking about. You know, you're, you're emotional. I was like, all right, I, I can help you. I was like, I know what I saw. I, I remember the cloud. I remember the cloud talking to me. I was like, yo, I'm, I'm in. A glimpse of God's glory in Jesus. Peter, James, and John were fortunate to get a glimpse of God's glory in Jesus. 
It was discernible and so magnificent that Peter wanted to set up a tabernacle to memorialize the experience. Most importantly, God opened their eyes to see in the spirit and hear God's voice. This is another thing we talked about earlier where we said, when you're in God's presence, when you're in the glory of God, all of a sudden, your sensitivity to the spirit realm increases dramatically. You can see things you couldn't see before and hear things you couldn't hear before. They could hear God's voice clearly. Yeah. They got to be in the cloud. They can see Moses and Elijah. They can see in the spirit. Why? They win the glory of God. Like those of us who enjoy being in our natural realm, it's fun, it's cool, but it's so limited. Yeah. We're limited by time, we're limited by space, we're limited by our small brains. And God is like, look, I can put my presence into your life in such a strong way that you can see things you couldn't see before, hear things you couldn't hear before. Increase your sensitivity to the spirit realm. Everybody gets that? Yeah. But let's talk about us now. God's glory in the new covenant. God's glory in the new covenant. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is what tomorrow is for us. This is what this week is for us. This is, what, this is what's real to us. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 70, verse 7 to 18. Let's read it together after 3, 2, 3. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? So here is Paul saying, that which Moses encountered is nothing in comparison to that which is available to us now that the Holy Spirit is with us. To the point where it was so amazing that a child of Israel couldn't look the man in his face. You ever met somebody who's guilty and they can look in the face? You know that feeling? There's somebody, you know, somebody in right? That's how you can tell when somebody's been talking about you. You, you look in the face and they're like, mm. what's it, you can't look, you can't look him in the face, what's wrong with you? Ah, you've been talking about me. <laughs> I can see it. I can see it. You can't see me. I don't like you. If I don't like you, I can't watch you in the eye. I don't like you. I want you to like. You see what I'm saying? And here is Moses, who was in the face of God. And the prince of the Lord was so strong in him that the children of Israel were so scared to even watch him in the face. They can't look him in the face. And Paul saying, that's nothing. That is nothing. How could that be nothing? Like, we, if we could just get that Old Testament stuff, we would have been amazed. Like, who doesn't want to encounter the Holy Ghost and you're glowing and all that kind of stuff? And Paul is like, that's nothing. Compared to the New Covenant. Let's keep reading. After three. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. He's like, man, that stuff that Moses had passing away. It was passing away. They, they, were, they had to kill animals and, I mean, the Holy Ghost would be available when the Holy Ghost chose to be available on select people. Now he poured the Spirit on all flesh. Anybody want the Holy Ghost? Get the Holy Ghost now. Anybody? They'd be like, hey, I want the Holy Ghost. Cool. Get saved. Open your heart. You ready? You see what I'm saying? Back then, it don't work like that. I mean, Moses selected a certain group of guys. And the Lord said, let me take your spirit and put it on those guys. And some of the guys didn't come to the, the, the service. They were back in the tents. And the Holy Spirit hit them here. And Joshua and Caleb were like, whoa, 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 whoa. How is the Holy Spirit on these guys? Let's go stop them. Moses was like, stop. Let them, let them have the Holy Spirit. He's like, I, I, I wish the Holy Spirit could be on everybody. They couldn't have it then, but that was, his, that was his wish, which was answered in, the, in Pentecost, when everybody got the Holy Ghost. But let's keep reading. If what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Keep going. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. This is how Paul described it. He's like, that was the end of something temporary. God created this as a stopgap before Jesus showed up to get stuff right. 
he had it with, with um, Adam and Eve, they sinned. Now he had to have this stopgap measure. These are the different things that will handpick certain people that pick Abraham and then through Abraham and get the children of Israel eventually. And now you know, we have Moses and that kind of stuff and we have to handpick people and judges and all these different things. And he was like, when, when the children of Israel looked in Moses' face, they were looking steadily at the end of what was passing away, both literally and figuratively. Figuratively, from the perspective of that whole covenant, that whole approach, that whole one man goes on our behalf thing, where you don't talk to God, you tell me what you need, I'll go talk to God for you, and I'll come back and tell you what God said. That is our old school stuff. With the Holy Ghost now, each of us can talk to God for ourselves. That's right. Back then, they couldn't approach God. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And it was like, and the longer Moses was away from God's presence, the glow faded. Mm -hmm. So he didn't stay, he wasn't the source mm -hmm. of the glow. Yes. He was a reflection of the glow. So, once he left the presence of the Lord, it just got less and less and less. And after a while, he was just Moses. Mm. First, he was Moses the glorious, then he became Moses the dude. Let's keep reading. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. Let's read that again. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. One more time. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. So, here you see Moses with this veil. Which obviously, as you know, when you read the Bible, everything's layered. It was a literal veil the man had over his face so he couldn't shine and scare people. Which also represented the veil that protected the Holy of Holies from Josh Moses from entering. And it's also a veil that was on their minds. Their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. In other words, they read the Old Testament and they can't see yeah. what's really going on. Which is why they couldn't recognize Jesus. They knew in the Old Testament who the Messiah was supposed to be, what he was supposed to do, all of that. And then the Messiah stands in front of them and they're like, hey, I'm waiting for the Messiah. Hmm. And he's like, here I am. No, not you, the Messiah. They're still waiting for the Messiah. He done come and gone back to heaven and they're still looking around. So where's the Messiah? Everybody's like, he been here, and he's gone. He's come back too. And when he come back, he's probably going to be like, hey, where's the Messiah? Yeah. But then he says, the veil is taking away in Christ. Mm -hmm. but let's keep reading. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. No. Nevertheless, no. when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Okay. So here is this whole parallel where they will read the scripture. But not only their minds are blinded. Their hearts are blinded. There's a veil blocking them from what they're reading. So they will read it and still not see the truth of what it's saying. So both literally, Moses couldn't talk to them plain without putting something on his face. The writings of Moses still can't speak to them plainly without a veil being over their face. Over their heart, over their mind. But the scripture says, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord... The veil is taken away. Let's keep reading. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. This word glory is doxa, the majesty of God, but also the perfect inner character of Jesus. So the scripture says, now, we have access because we have turned to the Lord and the veil has turned away. We don't have any veil anymore. And now the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord, who brings us the freedom we need, has allowed us now to behold the glory of God with an unveiled face. You see, here's what happens. When there's a veil, when you can't really see who God is, when you're blocked, by your personal opinions, by your tradition, by your mindsets, all that kind of stuff, it can't change you. It can't change you. I go up to somebody and tell them, hey, this is what the law says concerning this situation. And you're like, well, yeah, that's your opinion. I have my own. Cool. You will never change. You're stuck. That, which is why Jesus can preach all he want. And there were people who wouldn't believe him. They look at him like, okay, whatever. They're like, wow. I mean, that's like Jesus himself. Like, I mean, 
Mm. Or Jesus, Jesus said two words to us and we're on the ground crying. <laughs> yes, Lord. And other people he says something and they're like, yeah, whatever. There's a veil. And we see here with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. As long as we can see God in his glory, as long as we have nothing blocking us, no mindsets, no ideas, no attitudes, no opinions, no, well, this is how I see things. I just see God for who he is and I submit to what I'm seeing. Yes. All of a sudden, I get to be transformed into the same image. And when we talk about the glory of God, we're very clear. We're not just talking about the outward image. We're talking about the inner image of Christ from glory to glory. So gradually, the more time that I could spend with God face to face, with no pretense, with no veil, and I'm not trying to look a certain way, and I'm not trying to impress anybody, and I'm not trying to be sophisticated. I just want to see God for who he is, and I just want to submit myself to God. When I come to God like that, without the veil, and I can behold God's glory, yes. when I can see his majesty and his character, and it's just me and God, I am transformed to look just like him. And that's the glory in the new covenant, where no longer does God have that glory from afar off, and I can just see it, and it's amazing. Or I get to be like Moses, where I can encounter it, and it impacts me, but when I leave, after a while it begins to fade. No, when I encounter God's doxa, it changes my character, it changes who I am, from glory to glory, which means it happens in stages. It doesn't all happen at once, which is why it's always amazing why people think, you know, you get saved and all of a sudden you're suddenly transformed. Yes or no? Yes, from the perspective of your heart really does change. There is a shift. But there's a lot that still has to happen for you to be completely changed into who you're supposed to be. Because there's a lot of things that have to be undone. You didn't learn all that stuff in one day. But now you have to change your mindset and your mind has to be renewed. That's what he's talking about. The more time I spend with the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, in his glory, where it's discernible, where I'm no longer just religious about it, where I can tell this is the Lord. I can feel the Lord's presence. I can see God. This is deep. This is something special. The more time I spend in that kind of atmosphere, the more I begin to change. And it happens layers. I get it one week. Hmm, a little change. At two weeks. At three weeks. At four weeks. You spend a couple of years in the presence of the Lord. Like that. You wouldn't even realize how much you changed. You know like how Moses couldn't tell his face was glowing? You wouldn't even realize how much you changed until somebody who saw it before and sees you after lets you know. Like, run to you. What? Nothing? I'm cool. And you're like, what, 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 what happened? They're like, no, you changed. How? I'm, I'm the same person. No, you're not. Stop. <laughs> You're not the same person. Which is, which is why like when Christians try to go back and hang with their old friends, you know, and, and they're still in the same place, and, you, and you're trying to go back, hey, how's everybody? And everybody's like, we're good. Cool. <laughs> like, what's the, yeah, so what are we doing tonight? No, what we're doing <laughs> is going to the club. What you're doing is whatever you were supposed to be doing on a Friday night. That's what you need to be doing. We are not going where you're going, and you're not going where we're going. Like, don't try to hang like you're normal now. Yeah. And, you know, that's why the joke was when we went, when we went home. And um, that young man was talking about Friday night. He went to go vibes his friend. <laughs> and his friend was like, so what you doing here? Man, just come to vibes. Just come to vibes, yeah? He's like, vibes me? You're not supposed to be in church. It's Friday night. <laughs> and he's like, okay. <laughs> now I'm going to church. Why? What are you doing? The presence of the Lord has already changed you. You do not fit anymore. You don't look like them. You stand out. They can't watch in your eye. Which is why they, don't want, they can't have fun with you. You, you, are the, you kill the fun. Because you bring the presence of the Lord into their situation. And they don't want the presence of the Lord's situation because it's convicting. I just want to do what I want to do. Like, what's up with this Holy Ghost thing? Let me just have fun. And that's the thing about this. You spend time in God's glory, it will transform you. And you don't have to transform yourself. You just get transformed. Which is why all you're trying to do is get into his presence. So you don't have to change yourself. You get in the presence of the one who can change you. That's right. 
I ain't trying to be different. I'm just trying to be in his presence. I trying to be in his face. Hmm. He will make me different. Yeah. I wouldn't even notice I changed. Yes. You find yourself saying things you never believed you'd have said. Like, wow. I never thought I would respond like that. Mm-hmm. You know? Things that you two, three, two, three, four years ago, you'd have blown up over. You're all calm and stuff. Now you're like, well, it's cool. Hmm. Stuff you couldn't, you, what, you, I mean, you'd hold on to a grudge for six months. Now you're like, I forgive you. Mm-hmm. And you're shocking yourself. You look at yourself like, wow. What happened to me? Hmm. You've been in God's glory. That's right. He transforming you. Yeah. You're becoming that person he's dreamed you're supposed to be. But the only way you get to be that person is you're supposed to be in his face. In his face. In his glory. Hmm. You will be changed into what you see. Not just on the outside, but his inner perfect character. Everybody gets that? Mm-hmm. God's glory is now accessible to all who have turned to Christ. This unfettered access allows us to see God for who he truly is and reflect what we see in him in our own lives. So what must we do to see his glory now that he's made it available to us all? Worship. If I want to see God's glory and I know that when I'm in God's glory, I change. When I'm in God's glory, I know makes me bold like Peter and John. It takes one who is unlearned and elevates that person. I know when I'm in God's glory, miracles take place. I know when I'm in God's glory, wherever I was in bondage, I'm free. I know when I'm in God's glory, if I'm dealing with depression and the spirit of heaviness, all of a sudden, I have the joy of the Lord. I have the garment of praise. So if I know all of that comes from God's glory, also, I know when I'm in God's glory, I change without having to change myself. The glory changes me. I become like what I see. And I know the more I see God's face, the more I see him for who he is, I become like him. And I'm like, how do I get to see that? Worship. Worship. Closing scripture. Worship invites the glory of God. Worship invites the glory of God. We've been teaching that worship is a response to God's glory, but it's a cycle of glory. It also invites the glory of God. 2 Chronicles 5 verses 11 to 14, amplified. 2 Chronicles 5 verses 11 to 14, amplified. Let's read it together after 3, 2, 3. When the priests came out of the holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves, separated themselves from everything unclean, without regard to their assigned divisions... And all of the Levitical singers, Asaph, Haman, and Jeduthun, with their sons and relatives, clothed in fine linen, with cymbals, harps, and lyres, were standing at the east end of the altar. Done with them a hundred and twenty priests, blowing trumpets in unison. They roll up deep. They're serious. Let's keep reading. When the trumpeters and singers were to make themselves heard, with one voice praising and thanking the Lord. So this is the height of the worship. Anybody who's been in an atmosphere where there's been some serious worship, not a performance, because performances are great. I love a good performance. Hey, that's why we go to concerts. You know what I'm saying? That's what concerts are for. When you're in the height of the worship, it's one voice. One voice. The singers, the musicians, all with one voice. Praising and thanking the Lord. So here is the worship at its height. To the point where you walk in there and all you're hearing is one sound. You know something's about to happen. It's like it gets to that point where all of us finally get to that point where we're all in one. Because when you get to heaven, the 420 elders and all the creatures, they all in one. Those crowns go down at the same time. Everybody is in sync. Let's keep reading. And when they raise their voices accompanied by the trumpets and cymbals and other instruments of music, and when they praise the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever, then the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not remain standing to minister because of the cloud. For the glory and brilliance of the Lord filled the house of God. We understand how